Thank you, Eliana. Um, now to today's speaker, my colleague, Professor Steve Haber. Steve is an historian, a political scientist, and economist at Stanford, whose work has spanned several areas, including intellectual property and development, the banking systems of several Western Hemisphere countries, and the interaction between political institutions and economic policies for fostering innovation, improvements in living standards, and long-term development, both political and economic. Steve is the Peter and Helen Bing Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution, a think tank based on Stanford's campus, and the Milligan Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences with appointments in political science, history, and economics. He is the author of five books and an editor of five more. At Stanford, he directs Hoover's, Hoover Institution's Working Group on Intellectual Property, Innovation, and Prosperity, or IP squared. Steve uh, earned his PhD in history from UCLA in 1975 and taught for a couple of years at Columbia before moving to Stanford, where he has been teaching since. He's been honored with every teaching prize that Stanford has to offer and is an amazingly supportive colleague to all of us in the political science department and across the university. In today's talk, Steve will describe uh, some of his ongoing work on the ecological origins of democracy and prosperity, which draws on a rich theoretical model of institutional coevolution and empirical investigations that span the entire globe over many centuries. Steve will cover all of this in about 40 minutes, <laughs> after which we'll open the floor for questions, and I will collect questions from you guys two or three at a time uh, uh, before Steve answers. So without further ado, Steve Haber. Thank you so much, uh, Avi. Uh, I'm tremendously honored to be here. Uh, giving a public lecture. Uh, a bit overall, this is my first time in Nepal and uh, my first opportunity to give a public lecture uh, and to have such a large uh, and enthusiastic group makes me feel very, very flattered and very honored. Uh, I want to uh, not just thank Avi, I also want to thank the uh, Martin Chowdhury uh, Center, which uh, helped us run this conference for the past two days, as a co, we co-organized the conference and co-planned the conference, and it was a real treat, not just for me, but I want to say, from on behalf of my Stanford colleagues, uh, what a what a delight it was to get to know researchers at Martin Chowdhury, and I hope that we will be doing this again on a regular basis, so that this will won't be our our last trip to Nepal. Um, this is co-authored work with. Uh, two younger scholars, Roy Ellis and Jordan Verillo. Uh, you'll see in a few minutes, once you see all the computing work, why I needed younger co-authors. Um, you know, there's an age beyond which uh, you should not try to learn new computer programs, and I'm beyond that age. The other thing I want to do is apologize to you for my English. I am not a native speaker of English. I am from New York City. <laughs> that means it is very hard to understand me. So hard, in fact, my wife is here to join, join me, and she will, she, will, she will tell you this is true. She's from the middle of the United States, in the state of Missouri. None of her Missouri relatives understand a word I say. And that actually turns out to be a good thing. <laughs> and so we have had 33 years of very happy marriage because none of her can understand anything that comes out of my mouth. Okay. So I want to start by showing you some puzzles. I am not the first to have noticed these puzzles. These are long-standing puzzles. But we're going to try today to answer them. The first puzzle is this. On the, this axis, this is the degree of democracy as measured by something that political scientists call the polity sport. Zero is China. 100, Sweden. You with me? So we're going from very autocratic to very democratic. On this axis is per capita gross domestic product. Here, zero, 70,000 at the top. Now you notice an interesting pattern. As countries become increasingly democratic, GDP per capita goes up. And as GDP per capita goes up, countries become more democratic. Not making a causal claim, just saying that is a pattern. The two things go together. 
Some of you are already wondering who is this outlier up there? That's Singapore. <laughs> now, another puzzle. These differences in per capita income, they're not little. They're huge. So this is, you can't see it. I can't even see it. I'm standing next to it. But these are the names of countries. Here's per capita income. Red here, that's the country Liberia and West Africa. Per capita income, about $400. The United States is here. This red, that's Australia. The difference between Australia and Liberia is 50 times. Now, here's what's really puzzling about it. Australia was a British colony such that the only thing the British could think to do with it was turn it into a prison. They basically ran it as a forced labor penal camp run by the dregs of the British military. 200 years later, it's one of the richest countries on the planet. That's kind of weird. It's initial, many of you have probably read Ashwagandha and Robinson's book, Why Nations Fail. The initial institutions here were terrible. It's a prison. Liberia, never a colony. The initial institutions were modeled on the US Constitution. The eight, so Liberia is founded by former slaves and black freemen who leave the United States and the Caribbean, go, go to Liberia, and set up a country. The 1847 Constitution is modeled on the Constitution of the United States. Why, 100 and, no, 200 years later, Liberia, which starts with good institutions, presumably, because you have the US Constitution, has 2% of the per capita GDP of this British prison colony. That's a puzzle to be explained. It's not just democracy and high standards of living that go together. This is a relationship of the average numbers of years of schooling on this axis, and per capita income here on this axis. And you'll see again, they're going together. There's lots of good things going together. We need an explanation and lots of bad things going together. As a New Yorker, I tend to focus on the bad things that go together. There's no New Yorkers in the group. They don't find it as funny as <laughs> New Yorkers do. So we need to explain that as well. Another puzzle. If you look at the distribution of where the good outcomes and bad outcomes are on the map, on the globe, they're not randomly distributed. It's not like there's the wealthy democracies are sprinkled amongst, randomly, the poorer autocracies. Rather, you get a band of high-income democracies that runs across the north of the planet. You get Australia and New Zealand. It's only Japan is in that group. And then, near the equator, you get low-income uh, countries, which tend to be non-democratic or weak democracies. This is also a puzzle to be explained. People have been thinking about the, oh, another puzzle before I, I got ahead of myself. These patterns that we observe today, they're not timeless. <clears throat> if you went back to 1800 and you measured the level of economic development as the urbanization rate, that's the percentage of the population living in cities, which is a very good proxy for per capita GDP when you don't have per capita GDP. It's basically the people who are, what percentage of the population is not involved in agriculture? It's what you're picking up. If you were to put that here for 1800, incidentally, when I say if you put that here, we actually had to do this. This took a year. The opportunity cost of my time is very low, so we look, found every city in 1800 is more than 20,000 people. So here it is in 1800 on this axis. Here it is in 2010 on this axis. 
the line tells you what the relationship is. And basically, you've only explained 5% of the variance today in levels of economic development based on 1800. It's not to say all countries were the same in 1800. There were already differences. I'm going to focus on those in the talk today. But it's to say that whatever happened to create To create this happened in the last 200 years. As I, as I told you, somebody over the age of 30 should not be allowed to run a computer. More efforts. OK. You get the same thing for levels of democracy. There's actually no relationship between levels of democracy in 1800 and today, because there are no democracies in 1800. <laughs> There have been, so people have thought about these puzzles, different pieces of these puzzles, for a very long time. I don't have time, the 33 minutes probably I have remaining, to go through all of the answers. I just want to put the slide up to make it clear we are standing on the shoulders of many other scholars who go all the way back to Aristotle, who wondered why it was the Bulgarians were poor. There are, however, some facts about which people agree, and that's how we're going to sort of start to come up with an answer to the puzzles that are before us. So whatever it is that happened in the world that separated out countries into high-income democracies and then lower-income, weaker democracies and even lower-income autocracies, there's broad agreement that this happened sometime after 1800. There's also agreement that it happened because there was a series of technological governance and transportation revolutions, like the factory system, the invention of republican government, the railroad, the invention of parliamentary mass democracy, the iron hold steamship, the Australian secret ballot, Bessemer steel, refrigeration, there's a whole series of governance, transportation, and manufacturing or uh, production um, revolutions, great innovations, that occur in the late 18th and then in the 19th century. There's agreement that, that, that those, the, the ability to adapt those technologies easily is what's driving drives the difference. It's also agreed that every country did not have to invent those technologies from scratch. All you had to do was adapt them. So I bet many people in this room, to give an example, many people in this room, I bet, have a smartphone. Yes? But Nepal did not have to invent the smartphone. The smartphone had to be invented once. That is also true for the factory system. It had to be invented once. It's invented in England. And then the question is, how easily can societies adapt that system to local circumstances? That's what turns out to be hard. So the question is, what was it about local institutional and social ecologies, the way societies were put together, in terms of their norms, their social structures, their legal systems, their stock of human capital, and the distribution of political power that made it easy to adapt these technologies of modernity and the ones that come to follow on it. Why was it easy in some places and hard in others? Why easy in Australia, hard in Liberia? Why easy in the United States? which very quickly adopts the factory system and, in fact, adopts the British patent system um, and becomes one of the most inventive societies in the world, why does that work in the United States? And yet, when Mexico tries it, 40 years later, it fails miserably. Why is it that the United States events the concept of the Federal Republic? Mexico tries it in the 1820s and fails. 
So the question is, why do innovations stick in some places and not stick in others? That's the question to be addressed. Now, there's lots of ways to answer this question. People have been trying to answer this question for a very long time, so they've tried many things. All of these are valid approaches. There's no right way to do this. When you're asking questions of these magnitudes, what you have to do is use many complementary approaches, learn from one another to get ultimately to the truth. One approach is deep comparative history, where people study countries' histories and details. Another is to, for those of you who've read Ashmoglu Robinson, is to focus on the institutions and to technically shock the institutions and then measure the effect of that on economic development. The approach we're going to take, which is a bit hard, you'll see why in a minute, but we think it's very promising, is to say, let us simply ask the question, why were some countries able to easily adapt to technologies of modernity? We're going to identify a set of exogenous factor endowments. That is a fancy word for two easy concepts, biology, geography. So if you remember nothing else about today's lecture, other than the fact that I have a New York accent, you'll remember biology and geography. That's the key to this. What we're going to argue is that variance in biology, that is what you could grow, how long you could store it, how frequently you would be wiped out by weather shocks, whether you could use draft animals to produce it or not, those basic factor endowments shaped the way societies organized themselves before 1800, such that after 1800, some societies already had institutional and social ecologies that made it easy to adapt modern technologies. I'll explain this in detail, what I mean by this in a moment. We're going to start with the fundamental problem facing all human beings, which is food. So today, food moves around the planet at lightning speed. But if you went back before the fossil fuel revolution, food moved by ore, sale, and ox draw in part, or horse draw in part, which meant it's produced locally. So what we're going to do is we're going to recreate as closely as we can, as faithfully as we can, what the agricultural economies of the world looked like in 1800, using the technologies of 1800. And we're going to do it around the place that was the largest city in every society, or for every country or proto-country, in 1800. <coughs> so we're going to use innovations in modern computing in order to do this. I want to be very clear here. We are not claiming that geography causes GDP today in any direct, <coughs> meaningful sense of the word cause. What we're saying is geography and biology pushed, they gave a huge push to some societies in a particular direction that made it easy to grab onto the technologies of modernity. And they pushed other societies in a way such that it was going to be hard to grab on to the technologies of modernity. So it's not that biology and geography are causing something directly. Rather, they're setting up the conditions for what is possible to happen later. <coughs> I'm going to jump ahead um, to show you some maps to give you a sense of what we did. Here, of course, is New York City. Very important place, but it's New York City. Seinfeld was filmed there, so it's a good place. Woody Allen's from there. Here's what we did. 
New York in eight, is the largest city in the United States in 1800. And so we, any of you have ever used Google Maps? You can ask Google Maps, I want to get from Kathmandu to Pokhara. What's the, the fastest way? Google Maps will tell you. What's Google Maps doing? It's using a tool in a program called GIS to calculate how much energy it's going to take you to get to Pokhara using different routes. It does it seamlessly. You don't observe it doing it, but it's going on. We're going to take that same technology. You know in Google Maps, if you guys have ever used it, you can say you're going to walk, you're going to take a bus, you're going to take a car. Yes? We're telling Google Maps, you can either use a boat, a small boat, not much bigger than the size of the stage. The same boat you, Lewis and Clark used to go up the Missouri River in 1806. We're using it because we know in detail about that boat, its dimensions, and its draft and the like. Or you can use a horse-drawn Conestoga wagon. Those are the two technologies the whole world gets. And so we'd say to Google Maps, OK, when you go on overland, you've got a horse-drawn cart. Or you're on the water, you have a Lewis and Clark's boat. How far could you get with the amount of energy it took to move a ton of grain 50 miles over flat land? And now Google Maps, it's not really Google Maps, it's GIS, tells you. So here's New York City, and it tells you everywhere that's colored in, that's where you can get to with that energy budget. You guys with me? It's telling you you can get all the way to Boston. It's telling you you can get up the Connecticut River. It's telling you you can get up to Lake Champlain and then up the Mohawk River. And it's telling you you can get down to the Chesapeake. In other words, it's saying, given where New York's located with lots of water and navigable rivers, this one, this one, this one, this one, it says you can get really far. Now, let me be clear here. In order to do this, we had to go back and recode the world's rivers as they ran in 1800. We took out all the canals. We took out all the improvements where they dredged sandbars. We took out all the places where they dynamited the rapids. This took five years. I had to promise a lot of undergraduates good letters of recommendation for graduate school in order to get them to do this work. The code book is 1,100 single spaced pages. We did, we did every major river in the world because I'm a little nuts. <laughs> I told you I'm from New York. We're all a little nuts. <laughs> now, the other thing we did is once we had that shape, we said, well, there are data sets from the um, remote sensing from space that will tell you how warm the soil is, what the quality of soils are, how moist the soil is. And so the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN has worked out what will grow everywhere on the planet at about a 10 mile by 10 mile grid. So we're going to take the map transparency of New York. We're going to slap it over another map, a transparency of what grows where, where, well. And we're going to say to the computer, tell us of all the highly, potentially highly storable grains, there's about 21 in legumes, things that will store for a long time that are calorie dense and protein dense and potentially storable, how much could you have grown using as close as we can get to the technology of 1800? That is, you can code this for using no irrigation and no modern cultivars and no fertilizers. Where it's dark, where it's green, it says, yeah, you go a lot there. Where it's red, it says, forget it, too cold, too wet, too rocky, too whatever. Yellow, somewhere in between. So to give you a sense, comparatively, I'm now going to put up three, these four, these four graphs are of three economic hinterlands. Here's New York. Here's in Shanghai, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Here's Beijing, China. What I want you to notice is you can grow a lot more storable, high calorie, protein dense food in New York. The other thing I want you to notice, 
This is how long you can store grain for. It's a function of temperature and humidity. If you work out the algorithms from this, from the, from, there's a big agricultural economics literature about it. And for New York, it's about 160 days. Pretty long. Compare that to, in Schengen, the DRC, it's four times longer, but much less than Beijing. We then did the same thing for malaria. There are maps of, digitized maps of malaria. We did the same thing for the same interland. You guys with me? Here's in Schengen, very high malaria. No malaria in New York. No malaria in Beijing. We then asked how often, using data from the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration going back to the 1850s by month, how many times in the 160 years since 1850 have these places been hit by a drought so severe that it would have wiped out all agriculture in the entire hinterland? And in New York, the answer is about once every 150 years. And in Schengen, about once every 15 years. And in Beijing, about once every eight years. OK, now think about this for a minute. The problem is the problem of biological survival. Here you are in New York. How are you going to solve the problem? You always have to ensure against crop loss. Something bad can happen. The rain doesn't come, the rain does come, there's a hailstorm. I know you can see here that there are microclimates. Some places are better than others, let's say growing barley rather than maize, rather than wheat. <coughs> Given the fact that you're not all going to be wiped out at the same time ever, what do you do? The answer is you trade with each other. You ensure by trading. What do you get? And, and, and of course, because there's no malaria, people can work very hard. The, the problem with malaria, I should explain this, the problem with malaria is that it's not just that people are sick, they have to be taken care of by other people. It's usually children who are sick, mothers have to stay home, so you lose a lot of labor effort. One thing we haven't shown here, because there isn't for the space, was the tsetse fly ecology, which pretty much matches this, which means you couldn't use draft animals in the places with high malaria, but in New York, there's no CT flies. There's muggers, but no CT flies. What's the efficient way to solve the problem of potential scarcity? We trade with each other. What develops? Lots of small cities, not just New York, Hartford, New Haven, Philadelphia, Secaucus, New Jersey, and on and on and on you get a very dense set of markets. And it's decentralized. Now here's something I think is really fascinating about New York. New York, for those of you who read Ashwaubu and Robinson on why nations fail with the good institutions and the bad institutions, guess what kind of institutions it originally had? Extractive institutions. What's New York set up to do by the Dutch? It's to trade for beaver and otter pelts with the Indians. It's purely extractive. The British arrive in the mid 17th century. They force the Dutch out. Do they set up democracy? No. New York is called New York because it is given by the king to his brother, the Duke of York, as a proprietorship. They don't get an assembly till much, much later. So this is not a place that is initially set up to be um, economically wealthy and democratic, it turns out that way because you don't actually need the Duke of York for anything. Human beings are trading with each other in a decentralized fashion. What are they going to do? They're going to invest in institutions to facilitate trade. Courts, property registries, laws, they're also going to invest in human capital that's good for trade. That is numeracy and literacy. They're going to be, they're going to decide themselves as individuals, we need to educate our children. So one of the things that happens in the American colonies, in New York in particular, 
is schooling even before mass public education. This kind of what we call transactional ecology, in which people are incentivized to invest in human capital, in which there's lots of trade, lots of specialization, right? Because once you start to trade, once you create a city and people are trading in it, well, somebody says, you know, I don't like this agriculture thing. I think I'm just going to fix shoes. And I don't like this fixing shoes thing. I'm going to make shoes. And, uh, you know what? I think I'm just going to specialize in writing contracts. I'm going to become a lawyer. I think I'm just going to specialize, actually, in unwriting contracts. I'm going to become a lawyer and argue with the guy who wrote the contract. You're going to create a society that's all about laws in which all of the interactions amongst people, the way they deal with each other, is through the market. It is, in fact, this is just true of New York. It's true of the United States in general. There's almost nothing you can't contract for. And I'll leave it at that. Well, that was a joke, but nobody got it. <laughs> now, I want you to contrast that within Schenge in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This is the largest city in the DRC in 1800. It's got about 7,500 people at its peak in 1900. It's probably a little smaller in 1800. We don't know the exact number, but we know this is the largest city. It's the capital of the Kuba Kingdom. The Kuba Kingdom is a really fascinating place because it's so you'll see it's so far inland not affected by the slave trade. In fact, to the degree the slavery in the Cuba Kingdom, it's the Cuba enslaving people from outside and bringing them into the kingdom. It's the largest city in the current country of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. But you'll notice that here's its, it's about 40,000 square kilometers, its size, its hinterland, using the Google Maps algorithm. If we go back to New York, come on, go back to New York, it's 111,000. So the hinterland of New York is larger. And you ask yourself, well, geez, you can see this is a river. This is Senkura River. This is Kasai River. You hit the Congo River. You might ask the question, why aren't they trading out the coast? And the answer is, from here to here is all waterfalls. OK, I need to move faster. You're going to notice something else about this, this hinterland. There's a lot of red. So if you contrast it, I keep going the wrong way. Ah! See, I should be allowed to do this. There's a lot of red. We'll just leave it at that. This is, this is not productive land. It is very hard to grow anything, to grow storable crops in the Congo because of the soils and, and the and, uh, rainfall. You can see it here in potential legume and cereal production. Here's New York. Here's in Schengen. Here's moving. How about great storage potential? Here's New York. Here's in Schengen. It's too hot and humid to store the grain you would grow. Incidentally, they are growing grains. They're growing maize. They're, in fact, overwhelmingly using New World products. How about drought frequency? You're going to lose crops about once every 10, 12 years. Everything wiped out. <coughs> High malaria and high tsetse flies, meaning you can't work as hard because people are sick, and you can't use draft animals because the tsetse fly kills them. What is the best way to survive in this area? It's not to grow storable grains and trade them. If you can't store something, you can't trade it. It's not a store of value or unit of account. If it rots quickly, you're not going to pay very much for it. What's the efficient solution for people here? It's to grow things that don't have a season. The thing about high calorie protein grains and cereals is they're seasonal. And then you've got to store them. What if you could grow tubers like cassava or yams? Or tree crops like plantains and bananas? They don't have a season. That's actually the efficient solution. You grow cassava. Here's the problem. Once you pick cassava, 
you have one day to use it before it rots. Under ideal conditions, a yam, in laboratory conditions, you can keep for 18 weeks. But here in Central Africa, far less than that. So what are you going to do since you can't trade things, you can't store them and trade them? You're simply going to pick tubers as you need them and use them as you need them. You can leave them in the ground and let them continue to sprout. But now think about the, the institutional ecology you have set up. There's not a lot of trade. There may be trade in some luxury goods, leopard skins, cowrie shells, um, other high, very, very high value items that a nobility cares about. But you're not trade, you've not set up all of the incentives for people to be trading with one another. The efficient solution for survival is to grow food, pick it from the ground as you need it, pull from it from a tree as you need it. That's the efficient solution. It doesn't send you on a path about specialization, investment in literacy and numeracy related human capital. It makes it, what we're saying is, as I keep screwing this up, here you've set up an institutional social ecology where it's easy to grab the technologies of modernity when they come along. You have a literate, numerate, independent, trading society of people who are more or less equal. Here, you have subsistence farmers. Had you tried the New York solution here, it would have failed. Had you tried the solution here in New York, it would have failed. You can't grow cassava in New York. People did the best they could in the environment in which they found themselves. The people are really smart everywhere. Bad solutions are getting widowed out. I'm sure there was some clown in New York who thought we should grow cassava and pick it as we needed. That guy didn't do well. He got weeded out. That approach got weeded out. Now let me show you a third ecology. This is what we call an insurance ecology. So this is the hinterland around Beijing, largest city in China in 1800. It looks like an octopus. Mm. And you'll notice something very interesting. First, it's, it's somewhere between New York and, and Shenge in size. And second, you're going to notice that it's not quite as fertile as New York. Big areas of red and big areas of yellow. And so if you ask what's the potential kilocalorie production, it's about half New York, but greater than in Schenge. There's no malaria, so no lost work effort. There's no tsetse fly, so you can use draft animals. And now I want you to notice something very, very strange about it. Look how long you can store grain for. It's really dry. You can store grain there a really, really long time. Now look at how frequently you get wiped out by droughts. About once every eight years. If everybody is wiped out at the same time across an entire area, you cannot trade with your neighbor as an efficient solution to solve the problem of scarcity. Everybody's been wiped out. If I know I'm going to be wiped out, and I know that my colleague uh, Abby has, uh, is, has a store of grain, what should I do? I should hide my grain under the mic floor. I should steal his. And he's smart. So he's going to make an alliance with my wife, who knows where my grain is. And they're going to hit me over the head, and they're going to take my grain and split it amongst them. <laughs> but I know that they know that I know that they're going to do this. So I'm going to make an alliance with my new colleagues from Martin Chowdhury against Avi and Marcy in order to take their grain. What are we going to eventually hit upon as we scale up who's stealing whose grain? We're going to create a state. We're going to create a government. We're going to create something really, really big. What's this thing going to do? Well, it's going to make sure everybody shares grain into a central store because the drought can last a really long time, right? And the more we store it, the, more, the, the greater the temptation for other people to steal it we don't need specialists in, in trading. 
We need guys with big necks and big biceps who are good at violence. We also need guys who are good at taxing and counting, showing up at your farm and saying, I know how much grain you grew, and here's how much you owe the state. And if you don't pay it, a guy with a big neck is going to come and take it. You're going to invest in very different kinds of human capital, and you're going to create very, very different institutions. You're going to create a state that basically serves as a central insurance system. This comes into, this isn't just a theoretical construct. What do you observe in 18th century China, but the Qing Dynasty? What is its predominant characteristic? Centralized taxation, centralized grain storage, pushing and then pushing the grain out into the market when crops fail. Now here's the problem you've got. Once you create this big, powerful state with a bunch of guys with big necks and big biceps and guys who are good at taxing you, what incentive do they have when somebody comes up with the idea of democracy to get out of the way? None. What incentive do they have to encourage all kinds of investments in the kind of human capital that would be helpful in catching up in the Industrial Revolution, let's say grabbing onto the factory system. None. The incentives are reversed from the New York incentives. So this insurance ecology system is a completely different system. Now it's my job, I have like three minutes. OK. He's going to give me four. In the next four minutes, I have to show you how it works. So every dot on this, I'm going to just show you three slides and then I'm going to stop. You're going to have to trust me about the rest. Because I have about 1,800 slides. Because I told you I'm a little crazy. So every dot is a hinterland around a city. We did this for every city in the world, every largest city in the world in 1,800. Every dot's a city. And we, to here, because remember, we have all these variables. We have grain storage. We have how much you could grow. We have how far you could move it. We have. Do you have malaria? Do you have the CT fly? Can you grow sugar? Can you grow tubers? We've got lots of dimensions. I can't, no human being can turn eight or nine dimensions into a two, um, into a two-dimensional space. So here's just how I want you to think about this. On this axis is how many days you can store grain for. On this axis is how many shocks per century, how many droughts per century. This is places with very low capacity to produce storable, kilocal storable grains and lagoons. These are places with higher, mid and high potential. Green here are places in 1800 that are urban. They have more than 13% of the population living in cities. They're a standard deviation beyond the mean. Yellow are places just below that, above the mean. Red are places that are not urban at all, 0% living in cities, and the orange are in the, in the, the third to the bottom part time. And you notice there's no real pattern. You look at this, and in fact, if you do, uh, well, I'll show you some quick kind of metrics in a minute, there's no pattern here. Okay. Now I want you to look at 1900. All of a sudden, the pattern's starting to emerge. The high per capita income places that for countries that are increasingly urbanizing, they're here. In the places where you can store grain for at least 150 days, where you have very few drought events, and where you can produce a lot of storable food. Now I'm going to show you the change from 1800 to 2000. And again, green and yellow are going to be the places that grow the fastest, fastest economic growth. Where are the places that grow the fastest? The greens and yellows? They're here. In the places that in 1800, in the places that in 1800 were transactional ecology, had transactional ecologies, were set up to be transactional. Once you get into the low, the ability to produce very few kilocalories, you don't see a lot of fast economic growth. Incidentally, some of you are probably wondering, where's China? 
high to not a high area of storage. You grow a lot of kil kilocalories. Lots of shocks here, though. <coughs> How fast does it grow from 1800 to 2000? Much slower than, let's say, the Netherlands or Belgium or the United States or Australia. In fact, Australia, to go back to our start, is in this group. And Liberia, to go back to their start, is in this group. If you do the same thing with per capita income today, you get the same basic result. The wealthy countries are going to cluster here. The countries that grew fast since 1800. Okay. They're not going to be in the high shock zones. They're not going to be in the low, in the subsistence ecology zones. All right, I'm going to skip over all the democracy things, but I'm just going to show you in a quick animation. You can see the greens over time. The democracies are emerging in the same place. Now, just to wrap up, for those of you who care about econometrics, um, when you have like eight dimensions, and, and they're interacting with each other in ways that you don't understand what the interactions are, you can't use standard econometric procedures. Fortunately, geneticists confront this problem all the time, and they've, you, they've developed machine learning techniques to deal with the problem. We're using one here called a random forest. In Q and A, for those of you interested, I can explain how a random forest works. Here's what the random forest is telling us, what the econometric techniques are telling us. That the physical world, the biology and geography, is not explaining any of the variants. It's negative. It explains none of the variants in democracy in 1800. It explains none of the variants in urbanization in 1800. But it explains 31% of the variants in the level of democracy today. That's a lot. It's hard to explain that much variance. It explains almost half of the world's distribution of GDP per capita today. If you do it as change in urbanization, it does it about 37%. I'm not going to talk about schooling because I don't, I don't want to get into that. We have a separate test for that. Because at this point, what I want to do is throw things open to questions. But I want to simply leave you with the following core idea. It's not that geography and biology directly shaped the world. They pushed it in a particular direction. They made it easy to grab technologies in some places and harder to grab them in others. And so the relationship between geography and biology and the modern world is there, but not in some direct causal sense. The other thing I want to leave you with, we're explaining about half the variance in GDP today. We're not explaining all of it. Other stuff mattered. Like what human beings did, the wars they fought, the, you know, all the random stuff that happened. So we're not saying that we've explained everything. We're saying some simple biology and geography is explaining about half of what we're observing. Thank you very much. Mm. So, uh, we have time for uh, a few questions. Um, I'm going to collect uh, two or three questions. Um, I want to ask uh, everybody uh, that wants to ask a question to uh, stand up, um, talk loudly, and uh, uh, be very efficient and limit yourself to a question rather than a comment. Okay. Yes, please. Um, with the model, uh, how does it explain the different uh, area in Finland and Sweden where they don't have a good, uh, I assume they don't have a lot of production potential? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, another question? Yes, please. You have used frequently the word innovation. So what is the definition of innovation that you are, and the technological adaptation? So what is the technological adaptation that you are talking about? And can you, can you, uh, what about Singapore? Uh, which mm -hmm. kind of okay. okay. Yeah. So the first question about uh, the Scandinavian countries. Uh, so actually, the southern part of Sweden, southern Norway, uh, parts of Finland, uh, Denmark actually are pretty good for growing grains. They're not at the level, let's say, of the United States, but they're not bad either. The other thing is that once you've grown grains there, you can store them a really long time, but they're very long, cold winters. The other thing, which we can't model here, is they come up with a way, they also a transactional ecology, 
They create a way to store food. We just don't have a way to measure it. They're storing fish. All that awful pickled fish, that is their solution to the problem of human survival. We just don't have a pickled fish variable that we could throw into the computer of like where you can pickle fish. So it's the same sort of model. And so where they, they fall is, they're like these countries here. Actually, no, they're like they're these countries here. Uh, the question about uh, these technologies and modernity. What we have in mind, uh, so I'll give you an example. In um, 1853, a, a US fleet shows up in Japan and forcibly opens up the country to foreign trade. And they confront a society that by the standards of the United States and Great Britain and Germany is fairly poor. And the Japanese said, huh, we either modernize or we become a colony of these people. And that sets off a search for adaptations that, that can be brought from Germany, the United States, and Great Britain to Japan. So they create a parliament that's modeled on the German parliament. They adopt the factory system very quickly. They adopt a, a whole range of um, legal um, uh, innovations like the patent system, which they, uh, they, they create in the 1870s, modeled on the British. So what they very quickly are able to do is adapt governance, transportation, and production technologies developed elsewhere. And they're so good at it that they beat the Russians in 1905. By the 1920s, they've driven Indian-produced cotton textiles from Pacific markets. And by the 1940s, they're challenging the United States for control of the Pacific. It's a really amazing example of adapt the ability to quickly adapt other te technologies developed elsewhere. What's interesting about Japan is guess where it falls? It's in here. The other thing I'll say about it is that other countries try to do these things. Mexico tries to modernize also because it's scared to death of the United States. It tries the factory system, it tries the patent system, it tries to democratize, and it fails again and again. And the reason is these places have very, under, very different underlying institutional colleges. The distribution of human capital is different. The distribution of existing laws and existing political power is different. And so the, that's what we mean by the technologies of modernity. Now, the last question you asked was about Singapore. There's always an outlier. But here's what's interesting about, so remember, we're going to explain about half of the variance. Why is Singapore rich, even though it's actually not going to do well on any of these scores? And again, we're not saying that, remember, the mechanism here is all about creating an economy that's all about transacting, in which human beings don't need a central authority to decide, who can decide, what will be done or not done. I think that the story of Singapore as a free port in the 19th century creates an institutional ecology that is all about trade. And geography benefits them because they're sitting on the Straits of Malacca. Right? All trade from east-west, west-east has to go past them. We'll take some more questions. Okay, yeah. Yes, please. Um. Professor Haver, since I can't really comment, I'll make it a question. I'm just wondering um, how many other academic and scholars are doing a similar type of works and uh, to what extent are their conclusions and inferences similar to the type of conclusions you are coming? Because for me, this is like one of the first, this type of research and I can also see that given you have the power of defining variables and reducing it's always asked where maybe a function of a definition rather than quote unquote rare. So I'm just wondering what is the level of resonance you are getting from other similar academics? Okay, there was a question here. Yeah. Uh, regarding uh, technology, modernity and uh, capital, human capital, have you looked at the issues from the perspective of language disadvantage? Some of the countries have a disadvantage of language because they don't English and technology comes through English. Right? So 
I, I wonder if they are looking at it from the perspective of, I don't need to explain it, but some people are distracted to it purely because they, they do their business and everything on the ground alone, and some societies which are in between and some have advanced in lands. <laughs> okay, we'll take one more. Yeah? So, yeah, this so patterns start to emerge in like 1800s, but then like uh, the ecologies, natural ecologies must have been there even before that, and the smartest people's like, uh, intelligence is not really taken into account, and they're like, uh, yeah, saying that all, all of the all of the people have similar intelligence throughout the uh, so cultural intelligence and all those things are very uh, so my question is why did this pattern start to emerge before that? So I'm going to try to remember all three of these questions and answer them briefly. The first question about other academics. Um, if there's one thing that is true about academics is that they like to disagree with each other. How many people are there that are doing exactly what we're doing here? Well, fortunately, none that are doing exactly what we're doing or we wouldn't get any scientific priority. Are there people using other approaches? Yes. They're going to be our referees when we submit to a scientific journal. And they won't be kind. So uh, there is going to be a debate about this. Um, even though my own view is the way to the tr there's no one right way to the truth. There's you know these are complements to each other. When you're asking big questions like this, history is an input. Looking at institutions is an input. Looking at geography is input. Because we're trying to understand the patterns. But academia being what it is. We're going to have a fight to get published. One of my colleagues put it, the day after you get published, you get 10,000 citations, but it's going to be really hard to get published. The question uh, about um, the language. Yeah, so people can invest in learning another language. One of my favorite examples of this, in fact, is the Japanese, who very, very quickly realize, oh, we have to, if we're going to not become a colony of the United States, we're not just going to have to learn the factory system. We're not just going to look to learn. We're not just going to have. We're going to invest in learning how the German parliamentary system works. They look at different parliamentary systems, for example. And see, you know, this German one's going to work well for us. They invest in learning on the factory system. They invest on learning about the U.S. patent system. So even though they have a different language, one of the things they invest in is learning that language. Now there was a question about, well, why didn't this emerge before? Are there differences before? And the answer is yes, there are. The differences are subtle before 1800. I can show you some evidence for one difference in 1800. You can see already. You can't see it in the level of economic development. You can't see it in the level of democracy. Here is a place where you do see it. Investment in education. So this is. The, the um, if you're green, more than 8% of your po of your population have graduated primary school in 1820. Right? What's it? And it's a, we did 8% because that's a standard deviation above the mean. Where are those places? They're exactly the places that the theory would predict. So you can see it here. There's another issue we I didn't have time to get into. Why don't you observe this going way, way, way back? And that's because before 1500, countries have different agricultural and transportation technologies. One of the things that happens in 1500 with the discovery of the new world is the movement of plants, animals, tools, and transportation technologies around the world. Many of the crops, in fact, that we think of, uh, the potato, for example, is a new world crop. Maize, grown throughout Asia, is a new world crop. Um, the tomato, new world crop. Um, the uh, chocolate, a new world crop. Going the other way, draft animals, wheat, barley, oats, um, and various, various other cereals, such that, uh, and the other thing that's moving are transportation technologies, so that before 1500, there are differences in agricultural technology in terms of what you can grow because of what's indigenous to the, to that, to the new world or the old world. After 1500, 
when you get this movement of uh, cultivars and of tools uh, and of draft animals, um, you start to see the sort of the patterns emerging. The first place we can see it in, the, in any systematic data is the schooling data for 1820. Okay, I think we have time for two, maybe three more questions. Uh, so there's a hand in the back. Yes. Countries that are, that, that, yeah. 
I don't remember who the heck this is, to tell you the truth. I can't remember every data point, but yeah, there are some. One thing we have to do in this project, so here's what it, one thing we must do in the project is explain outliers. So we want to explain, I picked China, New York, and um, in Sheke because they're outliers in the, in the distribution of being high productivity, high shock, New York, high productivity, low shock, in Shenge, um, low productivity, mid shock. One of the other ways to go with this is to say, if we're, you know, is, is you should have places that didn't work, and why didn't they? That's something we're, we are, need to work on. So North Korea is an example. Right? There's events that happen in North Korea, the Russian army shows up. Um, <clears throat> there's other cases like, um, um, going the other way, like Costa Rica, which <coughs> shouldn't do well, but does. And then we sort of started to read the history of, of Costa Rica, and it turns out to be a really interesting place, because what they basically specialize in is growing coffee, which can be grown on small farms, and you get a sort of small farmer sort of society that grows up in, in, um, in Costa Rica. Um, what all this is to say is that this isn't the, the work of um, one person for one paper, one time. This is a research program for the rest of my life. And if we're successful, for the rest of yours, too. <laughs> OK. And with that, I want to thank Steve so much for coming here. And Wait a minute, they're in my pocket. 